China's GDP stood at just over $300 billion. 25 years on, as we have heard, uh, that economy is now worth an estimated $9 trillion. Uh, what, what can one say? Such figures, as the report says, are truly staggering, absolutely spectacular in the word of this report. Now, I'm going to bring a slightly different perspective to this and try and uh, relate it to what we must do in Britain. And I think we can refer to three distinct or discrete phases. Uh, firstly, China in particular and the, and the Far East more generally were seen as a source of cheap labour for the British industrial machine under the so-called cloak of making the UK globally more competitive. This phase is arguably over, of course, as we see some significant reshoring coming back to these shores from China and indeed the other emerging economies. The second phase from a British industrial point of view uh, I think was the staggering pace of development, the witnessing of that, and of course what we saw in Britain is a growing market for UK goods and services. Phase three, I think the current phase and where we are now, and I think which will project itself into the future, is that it's now by far the largest market in the world, uh, and of course it's rapidly developing its science, technology, and research base. Uh, out of necessity, we in the UK and British business are having to look at developing strong bilateral partnerships and close engagement at all levels. The discussion in the report, or this, the, the report provokes, is absolutely timely. It frames the key economic challenges we face on a much larger scale than the narrow borders of our own country, or indeed our own continent. It is our invitation to be part of the future. And it's an invitation we, British industry, cannot ignore. Our politicians, indeed, must think themselves fortunate that they do not have to govern 1.3 billion people. But let us be clear. Of course, our, the political leaders in China do not have to take too much cognizance of a liberal democracy, a free press, an independent trade union movement. So let us recognize in the comfort of our own free democracy that we must continue to recognize these issues, yes, and challenge them where appropriate. Looking back, many of my member companies, as I mentioned, regard, regarded and possibly still do uh, the Far East as a competitive threat, a source of significant price competition both at home and overseas. During phase one, as I mentioned, a common response was to export labor. To what extent we also exported jobs and capability, I think is not yet clear. The ramifications of that may become clearer in the future. Today the dial has turned full cycle. As our latest survey at EEF has evidenced, companies are investing in China and other emerging countries as a growth opportunity. The much vaunted rise of, of the Chinese middle class and its spending power is a massive opportunity that the UK and Europe cannot ignore. In fact, Britain's industrial place in the world can only be secured by winning adequate market share in this and other developing markets. Replace the term market opportunity with industrial survival. Phase three, the current phase, phase requires partnerships, engagements and relationships on a level hitherto never seen before. Direct market access is a thing of the past. In-country joint venture manufacturing distribution, logistics channels will be essential to secure and maintaining strategic footholds and future market share. We're already seeing this as we look at one of our member companies, a well-known iconic British business, Jaguar Land Rover, planning to invest £1 billion in partnership with Chevy Automobile to build a plant near Shanghai. I suspect that Jaguar's strategic aim of doubling its car production from currently 350,000 vehicles per year to 700,000 vehicles by 2020 would simply not be possible without this kind of strategic investment and indeed joint action. We're already of course seeing considerable Chinese investment in UK industrial and infrastructure projects and this kind of activity will only increase in our ever globalizing economy. Perhaps we're looking as I think Martin indicated perhaps the, the colonialism of sovereign wealth fund investment. We must be prepared to match that, work with it, and partner it. 
Between 2011 and 13, UK goods export to China increased from 9 billion to 12.4 billion, an increase of 33%. This is significant, it is welcome, and it's now a major export market for us. But let us also be clear that in the same period, the UK accounts for between 1 and 2% of Chinese imports, compared with 9% from the USA, 6% from Germany, and 12% from Japan. We are lagging behind as an industrial nation. Of course, as well as the physical exchange of goods and services, there's an ever-growing need for educational and business partnerships involving science, technology, research, exchange study programs, in-country learning, and work secondment, and of course, other cultural exchanges. The development of binding relationships that can only come about from a common understanding of one another's cultures. The one-way street that currently requires a Chinese, for example, to learn English, as this report states, must be a thing of the past. So what are we in the UK doing about it? What are our chances of, of success? What are our chances of outdoing the competition? What are our chances of winning, or at least taking part in this global race? I believe in a free market. I am a free marketeer. Yes, a liberally regulated and fair market, but a free market nonetheless. China and the other emerging East, Indi Indian, East Asian markets, I beg your pardon, of course, have more centrally and state-directed planning and control, more state involvement in economic planning, state ownership of enterprises they're able to protect through trade mechanisms, and of course they have more state direction of research, development and education. What is clear, however, from this report is that state involvement and direction has had a clear and positive impact in developing economic growth. The link, therefore, between state direction and economic success, I think, is too strong to ignore. Turning, therefore, to the UK model, I do believe that government has a strong role to play and an overarching industrial strategy can only help the UK achieve its goals. Industrial policy is therefore essential to success. Let us very briefly look at the UK's industrial strategy and check its fitness for purpose, to meet with and work with the dragons. Any industrial strategy, firstly, must have a clear economic and business objective. Look to the future and be future-proof. It must define, identify, and support key technologies, a range of technologies that are common as well as far as possible to cover more, one or more specific industrial sectors. To be fair, much work has been done by this coalition government. Eleven sectors and eight key technologies have been identified. I commend this, and I commend the work being done by the business sector and its team. But I do wonder how joined up, and to use the words of the report, how overarching that strategy is. As well as clear horizontal overarching themes, our industrial strategy must have integrated strands or pillars of connected activity. What are those pillars? Innovation must be encouraged and to a measurable degree funded by government. Support, support the report. TSB and applied research, the catapult centers, progress is being made, more can be done. Enterprise and entrepreneurship must be encouraged and incentivized. A consistent, cohesive energy policy must be created and delivered in terms of supply, reliability, and cost competitiveness. A focus on skills and training at all levels to meet the needs of British business and secure high levels of employment. An important element of this, of course, uh, involves apprenticeships and still STEM training generally, which we at EEF strongly support. A competitive tax system to encourage investment. A system of access to credit and a flow of finance for business to grow and invest. A clear and long-term infrastructure plan to improve maritime port access, airport, airport capacity, rail links, broadband, because something we use every single day of our lives, the strategic road network. And of course, continued UK membership and engagement with the European Union. These are all current elements of the UK's industrial strategy and some progress has been made in a number of areas. Forecast economic growth of 3% by 
and almost 3% in manufacturing in 2014 is welcome. But let us be clear, we in the UK are still some 8% below the level of manufacturing output of 2008 and some 20% below the level of investment before that dreadful recession of 2008 and 9. There is clearly still much to be done. I do not have time this morning to go through the various elements of industrial strategy, but let me in closing highlight one and support another important element of this report. British business and British business leaders overwhelmingly tell me that they strongly support membership of the EU. The economic benefits are clear. Let us push for reform. Yes, much needed reform over in Brussels, but let us push for that reform from within. At the end of the day, in our free market, it is business leaders and entrepreneurs who take the lead in the delivery of the investment, innovation, success and growth that we need. But that success cannot be delivered without a highly trained, skilled and motivated workforce. Economic growth and the wealth it generates must also pin, underpin high levels of employment and ensure a fair distribution of the financial reward that growth generates. Can we in Great Britain match and work with the Dragon and other East Asian economies to deliver to success? Yes, of course we can. But let us also recognise there is much to do and we all have a part to play in it. Thank you.